Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Science and Technology Q&A for Kids and Others. And uh, I see we have all kinds of interesting questions queued up here. Let's see. There's one here from Aaron. Can I explain neutrino messaging and whether it's feasible to build a neutrino messaging system or a neutrino internet? Okay, well, first of all, I have to talk about what neutrinos are, and then we'll get to the their potential uses. Okay, so what are neutrinos? Neutrinos are a type of particle, a little bit like electrons or quarks or photons, but different. And what happened, neutrinos were originally suggested in the 1940s, I think, and first actually observed uh, in the 19, late 1950s, I think. Uh, here's what happened. So. There's a process nuclear beta decay. So there are, there are some elements that are radioactive. There's some uh, substances like plutonium, some isotopes of uranium, these kinds of things which are radioactive. There are, that means that the nucleus of the atom kind of spontaneously self-destructs after some period of time. In fact, even just a single neutron, if you broke it out of an atom, if it wasn't bound in with the protons in an atomic nucleus, a single neutron will decay after about um, 15 minutes or so. And when it decays, this neutron sitting there, it turns into a proton, an electron, and an antineutrino. The thing about neutrinos is they're really hard to detect. So let's talk about the decay of the neutron. The neutron, which is a neutral particle, it has no electric charge decays into a proton, which has electric charge plus one, and an electron, which has electric charge minus one, and electric charge is conserved. So the neutron has charge zero, it, it decays into the proton charge plus one, the electron charge minus one, and that means the thing that's left over is charge zero, the neutrino is charge zero. But what was observed when people first started looking at nuclear beta decay, they would see things like, uh, sometimes they would just see, um, they would, they would see these particles come out, and another feature, in addition to things like charge being conserved, momentum is conserved. So that means if you have something that, uh, well, you, you, the, the, if, you, if you know that, um, let's see, if you have some object and it suddenly, uh, let's say it's a, it's a thing that's got two little pieces and they're connected by a, they have a spring in between them, and, but they're all held together, and then the thing that holds them together uh, is, is detached, and then they spring apart. Okay, what happens when they spring apart is one will go in one direction, the other will go in the other direction. If you looked at what, what the sort of the, the average position, the center of mass of these two things, it would stay stationary. That, that's because momentum is conserved, there's momentum associated with the thing, with one of the things going one direction, there's momentum associated with the other thing going the other direction. Those two momenta uh, are, if you sort of combine them together, you get zero momentum, and that's what you have to get because that's where the thing started, is with zero momentum, it started stationary. So whenever, so what people observed in these beta decay processes was they would see particles whizzing out in certain directions, and then they would say, what's going on? Because Momentum is supposed to be conserved, and that means these particles are whizzing out in these directions, but what's the thing whizzing out in the other direction that has a momentum going the other way that together will make the momentum of all these things be conserved? And um, so the, um, uh, the question, so a, a person called Wolfgang Pauli, uh, physicist also famous for Pauli's exclusion principle in quantum mechanics, um, was uh, the person who originally suggested, oh, maybe there's another kind of particle that's whizzing out in that other direction, we just can't see it. Um, in the case of the decay of the neutron, it's like protons, electrons, they're electrically charged, you can detect those kinds of things, but this other thing that's whizzing out in the other direction, it's not electrically charged, and maybe it's really hard to detect. Well, turned out neutrinos were really hard to detect. They were because they interact very weakly with most things. Most of the time, a neutrino 
uh, will you have a beam of neutrinos, for example, it'll just go straight through everything. And um, the uh, and what happens is uh, the, the, these there are different kinds of interactions between particles, basically four basic kinds, strong nuclear force, which is what holds atomic nuclei together, electromagnetism, which is associated with electric charges and electric fields and magnetic fields and so on. Um, then there's this so-called weak nuclear force, which is the thing that's associated with nuclear beta decay. And then there's gravitation, which is a separate story. But this weak nuclear force, as its name might suggest, is quite weak. It's, it's the thing, and it's the only force that a neutrino uh, kind of uh, is, is sensitive to. A neutrino doesn't have electric charge, so it doesn't, it isn't subject to the electromagnetic, uh, electromagnetic forces. It is not a strongly interacting particle like a proton or neutron or a quark or something that goes in an atomic nucleus. It's just a weakly interacting kind of thing. So uh, what actually happens? Well, you can have, uh, it's kind of a rule about particle physics and so on, that if you have something like neutron goes to proton plus electron plus antineutrino, then it's kind of a rule that you can say a little bit like uh, that, that you can kind of flip that around and say, well, it's also possible that a neutrino plus a neutron can go to a proton plus an electron. That, uh, that, that's um, that's a, a, a general principle in particle physics. It's kind of like uh, positive and negative numbers. If you've got a particle coming out, that's like um, a, uh, uh, you can kind of, um, uh, uh, you can kind of flip that around to being like an antiparticle coming in, so to speak. So in any case, you can, let's say you have a beam of neutrinos and you've got a bunch of neutrons, then you can have an interaction where neutron plus neutrino goes to proton plus electron. Okay, so that's a kind of mechanism for neutrinos to interact with things, but it doesn't happen a lot. The, the rate at which that happens is, is very low. And um, in fact, when one feature of, of that interaction is the, as the neutrino gets to be higher and higher energy, that reaction becomes more and more likely. So if you can have a higher energy neutrino, more likely that you'll actually see it scatter from a, neut from a neutron and produce a proton and electron. Um, that was something that was eventually observed and I described a little bit more about how that happened um, in neutrinos uh, in, in, in the early 1960s. So actually maybe even slightly earlier than that. Okay, so let, let's talk about what produces neutrinos. So as I mentioned, nuclear beta decay produces neutrinos. That's something when you have uh, in a nuclear reactor, when you're producing all sorts of different, uh, you produce all sorts of radioactive uh, isotopes, radioactive versions of, of uh, chemical elements in a nuclear reactor. And a bunch of those will, uh, will undergo beta decay and produce neutrinos. Kind of what happens in your typical nuclear reactor is you're breaking apart things like uranium nuclei and they'll sort of fall apart into a lot of smaller nuclei, a lot of nuclei of lighter elements. And it's kind of a random collection of different elements that you produce. You're producing these different isotopes. Isotopes are versions of an element. So the, 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 you, know, you characterize an element by the number of protons in its nucleus, which is equal to the number of electrons that it will normally have. So you know, hydrogen is one, helium is two, lithium is three, and so on. But then you can have in the nucleus different numbers of neutrons and those are the different isotopes of the elements correspond to when you have nuclei with different numbers of neutrons. Same number of protons for a particular element, but different number of neutrons. So when in a typical nuclear reaction in a, in a, uh, in a, in a nuclear power station or something, you will generate some quite random collection of different uh, isotopes of different, uh, of different elements that come about when the, let's say, uranium nuclei uh, broken down by the process that um, uh, leads to um, uh, uh, that leads to power generation in nuclear reactors. Okay, so you get these random collection of isotopes, and many of those isotopes will happen to be radioactive, and they'll happen to be radioactive 
with uh, with the, the produce uh, the undergo beta decay and therefore produce neutrinos. So from your average nuclear reactor, there'll be a whole bunch of neutrinos produced. And uh, so that's one big source of neutrinos. In fact, the, the first way that neutrinos were observed was by having, oh, there's a nuclear reactor here and somewhere quite far away, you could observe that there were neutrinos that have been produced in this nuclear reactor. It's kind of like nothing is being transmitted from the nuclear reactor to the experiment you're doing or nothing you can see is being transmitted, but somehow that whatever is transmitted can interact with neutrons, let's say, and produce protons and electrons. So that was kind of how neutrinos were first observed. The um, was from, uh, from nuclear reactors. There are other processes that produce neutrinos um, that are a little bit more controlled in terms of, of the neutrinos they produce. Because in a nuclear reactor, the core of the nuclear reactor just has all these reactions happening and neutrinos are going out in all directions from that. Uh, one way you can produce much more organized neutrinos, really a beam of neutrinos, is in a particle accelerator. You produce uh, particles called pions. So in an atomic nucleus, in a first approximation, the thing that sort of holds the protons and neutrons and so on together is the exchange of particles called pions. Um, and pions are particles about one-tenth the mass of a proton. And when you kind of crash protons together hard, they will kind of, uh, you'll, you'll end up producing a whole bunch of pions. And pions are short-lived. They decay in a hundred millionth of a second. Um, the, uh, and it so happens that pions, the, uh, well, at least the positive and negatively charged pions decay primarily to muons and neutrinos. And so that's muons are kind of like heavy versions of electrons. They're also unstable. They decay in about two microseconds, two millionths of a second. Um, they decay into electrons and a couple of neutrinos. Um, the uh, pions decay into a muon and a neutrino. But because the of the way that momentum works you can have you have so pions among other things are, are charged particles which means you can direct them using magnets and things and so that means you can kind of organize your pions to be going in a definite direction then they decay and there as they decay they produce neutrinos neutrinos are kind of more or less going in the direction the pions were going in and so that's the way that you can make kind of a beam of neutrinos and so that's something that big particle accelerators like Fermilab and so on, people routinely make neutrino beams by having a bunch of protons. They, they turn into pions that they, well, as a result of colliding with other protons, they produce pions, the pions decay into neutrinos, the neutrino, but the pions have been sort of organized to go in a different direction. They decay into neutrinos, you have a beam of neutrinos. Then you can sort of direct that beam of neutrinos to then interact with more stuff and see whether you can detect the neutrinos. Because the only way you can tell that there was a neutrino there is by seeing it interact with things and produce particles that you can readily detect, like protons and electrons and so on. Okay, so those are two sources of neutrinos. Another source of neutrinos that was for a long time very controversial was the sun. The sun is a great big uh, example of nuclear reactions going on, and many of those nuclear reactions produce neutrinos. The one question is, uh, what's the energy of those neutrinos? The most energetic neutrinos were produced by a rather obscure reaction in the sun. That's a, uh, uh, the sun is mostly taking hydrogen and fusing hydrogen nuclei together to make helium, but there's a, a sort of a complicated side chain involving boron, a uh, slightly heavier element that um, has, uh, um, in which the highest energy neutrinos were produced. And that reaction only was thought to take place in the very center of the sun. And the amount, the rate at which that reaction took place depended very sensitively on the precise temperature of the center of the sun. It's kind of hard to measure the temperature of the center of the sun. It's maybe, I don't know, 10 million degrees or something, but it's, uh, uh, we don't get to see into the center of the sun. One reason we don't get to see into the center of the sun is because the light that's coming from the center of the sun, it's like the sun is really very opaque. It's not like it's, it's transparent. The outer layers, are, are quite transparent. And once, once one's produced a piece of light near the very surface of the sun, it will just go out uh, easily enough. But if you produce a photon of light in the center of the sun, it can take like a million years to kind of gradually 
kind of make its way to the surface of the sun. So we don't get to sort of see into the center of the sun, at least not with photons. But neutrinos, on the other hand, a neutrino produced in the center of the sun, the chances are it will just go straight from where it's produced in the center of the sun, out of, out of the sun and come to the earth. And if we have a neutrino detector, and it so happens that neutrino kind of ends its, its life, so to speak, being scattered in that neutrino detector, we get to see it. And the sun is presumably producing huge numbers of neutrinos um, because sort of every, every nuclear reaction that takes place more or less produces some neutrinos. Well, that's not quite right. The, the many produce some neutrinos and these ones deep in the sun can produce high energy neutrinos. So for a while, people would try to detect neutrinos coming from the sun, and it was very mysterious because they didn't observe any neutrinos. And it's always very suspicious when you do an experiment and say, we saw nothing. That's always, uh, uh, you know, it's hard to know because it might be that there's something wrong with the way your experiment was set up, and that's why you saw nothing rather than that was really nothing there. And when you do a neutrino experiment, it's a tricky business because you basically have to get rid of, uh, so, what you're looking for is something which uh, you see no sign of it until suddenly inside your detector, you uh, observe the result of scattering by the neutrino. And so people try and take neutrino detectors and put them in places where all other particles would have been kind of removed because it's underneath a mile of rock or it's deep in the ocean or it's underneath the, the, uh, the South Pole um, or something like this. And so there are particular locations like the Mont Blanc Road Tunnel is one, one location. There are some deep mines. Um, there's some, there was one attempt to, to do something in the ocean off Hawaii. Um, there's one at the South Pole actually also, um, where the idea is to have your detector for neutrinos be, be so deep uh, underneath so much rock that every other particle that might be coming through, if there was an electron, a proton, and a muon or something like that, that would have long ago been, been stopped and scattered and only the neutrinos would survive and get to your detector. So, okay, so that, that's sort of the, the um, uh, so, so there was this big mystery for a while that there weren't enough neutrinos from the sun and people were a little bit concerned. Maybe the center of the sun has gone out. Maybe it's no longer producing energy and that would be sort of disastrous, but fortunately that didn't turn out to be the case. And it was just that the experiments weren't being done quite the right way. And once things were set up correctly, neutrinos from the sun were observed. And, and there was another tricky issue because neutrinos, there are three different kinds of neutrinos and they react in slightly different ways. And as neutrinos, can kind of mix. So you kind of start as one kind of neutrino, end up as another kind of neutrino. That's a, that's a different story to be told. But in any case, the, in a first approximation, neutrinos interact very weakly and uh, go through uh, huge amounts of rock, but you can, if you're lucky enough, the, any particular neutrino will interact inside your detector and you'll be able to notice that it was there. So people wondered what you could use neutrinos for, and people talked about using neutrinos to kind of x-ray the Earth, so to speak, with neutrinos, where you just use neutrinos, for example, coming from the sun or maybe coming from a nuclear reactor, and you could uh, uh, kind of detect those neutrinos on the other side of the Earth, but exactly how many neutrinos you detect could depend on what kind of rock, for example, was present because certain kinds of rock will scatter neutrinos a bit more than other kinds. Okay, so neutrino messaging we were asked about. The question would be if there were, uh, if, if we wanted to, for example, send a message from one side of the earth to the other going through the center of the earth. So normally, you know, the fastest way you can get a message um, from one side of the earth to the opposite side of the earth is to, oh, I don't know, send it through a fiber optic cable or send it by radio between satellites or something. And clearly that uh, you, you're having to go round the circumference of the earth. If you could actually have something which would send a message directly through the center of the earth, then you save your, your pi over two of uh, circumference versus, um, well, you'd save your, your, um, uh, yeah, your pi over two of, of half circumference versus diameter, about 1.5, 
So you, you're sort of 50% shorter to go th just through the center of the Earth. So that would be sort of a win if you could pick up neutrinos on, on the other side of the Earth. But in order to make this work, you have to have a source of neutrinos that you can switch on and off. That's tough to do because your typical nuclear reactor doesn't just, it takes a while to start um, uh, to, to switch on. It takes a while to switch off. It's not, um, it's not something where you can just say, switch it on, switch it off. And you can't have a big shutter that says, okay, we, we, we uh, drop this shutter and then we're blocking all the neutrinos because the whole point is very little, it's very hard to block a neutrino. So tough to, tough to sort of organize that. Um, it, we might think about, you know, the extraterrestrial civilization that's uh, using neutrinos to communicate with uh, other extraterrestrial civilizations, not quite sure in kind of empty space between stars, for example, you might as well use photons of light because they, uh, you know, you can, uh, light that comes from the, the very edge of the universe can reach us perfectly well. Most light never runs into anything coming to us from the edge of the universe. So I'm not sure that neutrinos are a big advantage there. Um, there, are big, there are sources of neutrinos in the universe. A big source of neutrinos in the universe is supernovas, uh, exploding stars. And when stars explode, they are exploding because of basically nuclear reactions that happen. And those nuclear reactions, like other kinds of nuclear reactions, produce random collections of isotopes, many of which uh, decay in um, uh, produce neutrinos. And many of the nuclear reactions, many of the primary nuclear reactions that, um, uh, uh, that, that are involved in, in, uh, in a supernova will also produce neutrinos. So when there's a supernova, there'll be a burst. So a supernova star collapses, might take a few seconds to collapse. Um, the final part of the collapse might take a few seconds. There'll be a big flash of light. Um, and there'll also be a flash of neutrinos at the same time. Detecting those neutrinos will give one information on what's happening sort of in the center of the supernova, because neutrinos are coming all the way from the center of the supernova, whereas whatever light is coming is coming from the surface because the light doesn't get through the sort of interior in the same way. So people definitely interested in detecting bursts of neutrinos, and there's some evidence that they've been detected from supernovas that have happened. There's typically in a, in a galaxy of our size is about one supernova every thousand years. Um, and that means if we look at a bunch of other galaxies further away, we will see supernovae with some frequency. And uh, there's a question of whether we can detect sort of neutrino flash from those things. And the answer is yes, we're sort of at the edge of being able to detect that. An interesting question is, does the flash of light as we detect it arrive at the same time as the neutrino flash? And the answer is, it seems yes. And that's an important thing to know because it tells one things about, what well, tells one things about the, uh, the, the, the photons are presumably traveling at the speed of light. The neutrinos, uh, the neutrinos have a very small mass, travel very close to the speed of light, but not exactly, but presumably at the speed of light. And there are other things that one can learn from looking at neutrinos versus photons uh, moving through interstellar space. That was a much longer answer than I expected to that, that question. Um, and uh, um, I think the answer to, is it feasible to build a neutrino messaging system is no, not really, not anytime soon. And, you know, is there a neutrino internet operating between all the extraterrestrial civilizations that we've never seen any evidence of? Um, the answer is, I think it's not, not uh, based on the technology we know today, it's not your best source of um, uh, best way to send messages. I will say that it is conceivable that there is a much more efficient way to detect neutrinos than we already know. Um, I actually thought at one point in the 1980s that I might have figured out how to make such a thing. Um, I'm actually quite glad it didn't work out because uh, one of the features of being able to detect neutrinos uh, very easily is that you can detect nuclear reactors everywhere. And particularly at that time, it was a sort of a big issue that where there were nuclear submarines that were prowling around the oceans um, and American ones, Russian ones, et cetera. And uh, they were thought to be, oh, nobody knows where the nuclear submarines are. But if you can detect neutrinos easily, you can just detect, detect the neutrinos that are coming from those nuclear submarines.
um, and you could find out where all of them are, and that's not necessarily a good thing. So the, uh, uh, and the same uh, right now, one of the things that's become popular with neutrinos is I mentioned that neutrinos are produced by nuclear reactors. Uh, you can tell uh, quite a bit about uh, the details of what's sort of inside a nuclear reactor by looking at neutrinos it produces. And so there's kind of this idea of if you want to tell whether somebody is operating a nuclear reactor that's just producing electric power versus a nuclear reactor that's being used to make um, kinds of isotopes that are relevant for making bombs and things, you can potentially detect that by having sort of a, you know, a neutrino detector that's, that's, you know, that's not, that, that, that's, um, uh, I don't know, some, some small distance away from the nuclear reactor, uh, kind of just outside the perimeter of the facility or something, you just have this, this big neutrino detector there, and then you see are there neutrinos being produced and how many are being produced. See, it's, it's pretty hard sometimes to tell what's happening in a nuclear reactor because nuclear reactors are all sealed up, uh, partly because of radioactivity and so on, they're all sealed up and uh, it takes a while to sort of uh, shut one down and kind of get it ready to open it up. And then, then you can kind of look inside and then you close it all up again and then you keep running it for, for potentially years at a time. So it's very inconvenient to say, hey, show me the inside of your, nu your nuclear reactor. So if you can detect that remotely using neutrinos, it's a much better idea. And that seems like a pretty feasible thing to do right now. Okay, let's see. Um, well, um, question from Jonas here, as is a particle physics question, noting that basically all the particle physics experiments we've done, we've done on the earth. And there's a certain amount of gravity on the earth. And the question is, it's a good question, I've never thought about it before. The question is, how do we know that the results we get from those particle physics experiments don't depend on the fact that they have been done in the gravity of the earth? Um, that's a good question. There is, uh, I'm not sure we have terribly good evidence about that. Um, the furthest away that we kind of get to see particle physics happening is in cosmic rays. There are particles, many produced by the sun, some produced by various processes in distant galaxies in many cases that are accelerating particles, mostly protons, to very high energies. And those protons, eventually, if they reach the Earth, they will typically uh, interact in, in the atmosphere, and they will produce a whole shower of particles. Sometimes it's a shower of particles that's many miles across by the time it gets to the surface, because just one proton uh, 50 miles up interacts with uh, protons, uh, with, with uh, atoms in the atmosphere, and there's this whole kind of spray of particles that's produced called an extended air shower. And these things can, there can be uh, thousands, tens of thousands of particles produced over, a, uh, over an area that's, that's many miles across. So probably the furthest away kind of particle interactions that we have directly seen, I think, would be from things like extended air showers um, of cosmic ray interactions that are happening uh, still in the gravity of the Earth, but it's slightly weaker gravity. But I don't think we know um, in detail whether the uh, detailed properties of those interactions are the same as the detailed properties of the interactions that we see in an ordinary particle physics experiment on the Earth's surface. So it's a good question um, whether, for example, uh, one could expect well, that there isn't a lot of variation in the gravity of things on the Earth. Um, there's, there's obviously some effect of the gravity of the moon and the gravity of the sun, and we see that in, in the pulling the oceans up in tides and so on, but that's not a huge effect. Um, I suppose that one could try to measure whether, for example, the um, that's kind of a funny thing to ask. It's kind of almost like, um, uh, do the particle physics experiments come out with different results at the full moon 
than at other times of the month, so to speak. Uh, I bet nobody has ever looked at that. Um, I, I'm sure the answer is no, but I bet nobody's ever looked at it. Um, the, uh, so one could, uh, let's see, what, how else could one figure that out? I think it's gonna be quite a while before there's a particle accelerator uh, on the moon. And uh, one could ask the question, I suppose, um, actually, I wonder whether there's been any particle physics experiments done um, in Earth orbit. Uh, I don't think there's ever been a, uh, certainly radioactivity has been observed in, in, uh, in Earth orbit where there's sort of effectively no gravity because there's uh, one's, one's uh, uh, weightless and sort of free fall in orbit around, around the Earth. Um, and um, um, let me see, I, the, the, I don't think there have been particle physics experiments done because I don't think there's ever been a particle accelerator um, in Earth orbit. Um, at least nothing, well, that might not be quite correct. Might not be quite correct. I doubt there's been a, uh, there, there might have been particle accelerators in Earth orbit for military purposes um, because one of the things that uh, is relevant is when, if you're trying to shoot down some missile, that's an intercontinental ballistic missile, for example, that's going from one continent up into kind of low earth orbit and back down again. Um, if you want to kind of shoot that down, one approach that people have considered is particle beams, um, where you basically make a, um, uh, a beam of protons, for example, and you kind of, um, uh, shoot it from a satellite um, and try and shoot down the missile or something using that. And I think there were definitely experiments done on particle beam weapons like that. So, so maybe that's caused there to be a particle accelerator in Earth orbit. If that happened, I wonder whether anybody looked at whether the uh, probability of interactions between protons and so on was the same there. I'm sure they assumed it was the same as on, on the surface of the Earth. Um, but it's a good question. I, I doubt that's been looked at. Um, let's see. Oh, there's a question here. Why should gravity, which is considered a very weak force compared to others, have any significant effect on particle physics experiments? Um, one wouldn't expect it to have. One absolutely wouldn't expect it to have. But, but you know, the nature of experimental science is it's sometimes worth doing experiments even when you're pretty sure you know what the answer should be um, because it, it could be the case that, that um, there's some tiny effect that's never been noticed where once you see that effect, you say, aha, that explains all these other kinds of things. But yes, based on the standard models of, of, of physics, one would expect that effect to be very small. Now, an interesting question is in the, oh, that's an interesting question. In, this, in a strong gravitational field near a space-time singularity of the kind that you would find like in the center of a black hole, for example, what effect would that have on particle interactions? So let's say, for example, that you, are, you, have, you have the singularity in space-time. That means, among other things, that uh, any, any object, uh, just like the, uh, uh, the moon, has a gravitational effect on the Earth. It has a tidal effect on the Earth. It pulls the pieces of the Earth that are closer to the Moon. It pulls them a little bit more towards the Moon than it uh, than the center of the Earth, and it pulls the things further away from the Moon a little bit less far, hard than it pulls the center of the Earth. And so that means that there's this tidal deformation of the Earth that the Earth kind of is pulled uh, the, the uh, outwards towards the Moon, and it kind of bulges and, and outwards away from the moon. So, so, you know, if the earth starts as a sphere, it, it deforms slightly to become something that is more like an ellipsoid um, where it's been kind of um, as a result of the, of, of the gravity of the moon. And when that's applied to the liquid oceans, that has the effect of pulling up the ocean that's close to the moon and also letting to be sort of uh, up the, the ocean that's far from the moon and the, and the oceans that are sort of on the two sides are 
are not uh, are not sort of uh, pulled pulled up and let to go let to go in the opposite direction. Um, and so that kind of tidal deformation, named that way because it's what causes the tides, is something you expect in general um, as a result of, of gravity. And the, the Earth, by the way, also has solid tides. It's slightly even the solid structure of the Earth is slightly deformed by the gravity of the Moon. When you are approaching a singularity in space-time where the gravity is infinitely large, then the, uh, that effect, that tidal deformation effect, becomes similarly eventually infinitely large. So that means that if you had a, an object, you know, a planet, let's say, that was getting very close to this singularity in space-time, you would end up with the planet will be very deformed, very tidally deformed, um, and eventually sort of uh, the, the, the term that's that's used in the business is spaghettified. It will be turned into, the, the, it will be just sort of shredded into sort of spaghetti-like um, structures. Okay, so the question that one might have is, what would that kind of effect, what effect would that kind of thing have on, for, for example, uh, particle uh, uh, interactions between particles? Um, I have to believe, let me think about this for a second. Um, well, I'm sure there's some effect. Okay, so it's a little hard to understand what effect that would have on particles that are supposed to be perfectly, that are supposed to be sort of perfect geometrical points, like things like electrons and quarks. In our model of physics, they're not perfect geometrical points. And so there'll be a slightly different effect there. But a question that one might have is um, for something like a proton, which is very small by our standards, but quite large compared to, uh, you know, a proton is a, is, a, is a big hefty thing with definite size, um, even though it's, um, uh, it's not, uh, not even, it's, it's known, been known for a long time, not to be just a perfect geometrical point with no extent. So a proton would presumably get spaghettified, so to speak, by the effect of strong gravity. And certainly the interaction between protons, the probability of two protons kind of interacting would be changed by that. Um, and let's see, one could probably work out uh, in a first approximation, I think it will be changed um, as a result of literally the, the you know, in the, in the, without gravity, the, the proton might act like a sphere and then there's some chance of two spheres hitting. Um, and if the thing has been turned into this kind of uh, very elongated shape, the probabilities will change somewhat. Um, and I think I could imagine how to compute that uh, because it's related to uh, various kinds of yeah, electromagnetic scattering theory. In any case, the, um, there might be some other effects there. Let me think. Um, yeah, let's see. In... Um, yeah, I, I think there'll be, okay, so, so there's an analog of this. Boy, okay, I'm, I'm descending rather deep into, into rather technical physics here. But um, I think, yes, what one would expect to happen, uh, well, ba basic bottom line is, there definitely would be an effect on particle interactions from the very strong gravity, very close to a space-time singularity. We are very far away from a, a space-time singularity. The the, um, the 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 sort of the 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 difference of space from being perfectly flat in a sense for us is it's incredibly close to being perfectly flat. Whereas in uh, near the singularity, it's sort of infinitely curved. So there's a huge difference between what we can observe on Earth and what we would observe near a black hole. But I think that, that um, uh, uh, there would be an effect from that which would be interesting to work out. And actually, it's not, a, um, not impossible that that's an effect where there would be a significant difference between the, what we now believe about physics with our model of physics involving uh, discrete structure of space-time and so on, and what uh, sort of older... <laughs> 
theories of, of, of physics have suggested. So it might be an interesting, um, interesting thing to work out. Uh, let's see. Um, Gosh, there's a question from WW here relating to thermodynamics. Um, how could we detect and remove the impact of refrigeration and air conditioning indoors on outdoor global temperature? And is it significant? Um, I don't know the, the numbers for this, but the, uh, well, let's see, maybe I could try to explain how refrigeration works. Um, I think I explained that once before. Let, let me not do that here because I'm pretty sure I explained that once before. So we should just find a, a reference to where I where I did that before. Um, let's see. Oh, there's another one of these uh, kind of could we do this uh, question from Asa. Can we build a giant magnifying glass and put it in orbit to create a death ray? Well, hmm, I think, uh, so what that I think is referring to is if you were to concentrate the light of the sun, for example, as you can do with a magnifying glass, for example, on, on, you know, on a sunny day, you have a magnifying glass, you uh, concentrate the light from the sun into a single spot um, and you can like burn a piece of paper or something. Um, particularly if the paper is black so that it absorbs more, more, uh, more light um, and therefore the, um, the, the, the light will heat it up more, more easily. But the question would be if you had a giant magnifying glass, could you have it in Earth orbit and you kind of align it properly and you've got the sun over here, you've got the magnifying glass here and you've got something on the surface of the Earth and you'd be heating it up and maybe heating up some water or something and maybe deriving power from it or some such other thing. Um, I think that there are many problems with this picture. Um, the, uh, well, first point is, uh, by the time, let's see, um, at some point, by the time you've concentrated enough energy in one place, you will, I think, it's a good question. Um, okay, so, so normally light goes through the air and you have more intense light, more intense light goes through the air. So you have light consists of a whole bunch of photons. And when the light is more intense, when you, you know, the brightness of the, of your, you have a brighter bulb or something like this, all you're doing is just have more and more and more photons. Um, the, the question is, is there a point Yes, there's eventually a point at which any material, so in, in a vacuum, you can just put more and more and more, more photons through a vacuum and nothing much will happen to the vacuum. The photons are all independently going through the vacuum. There's a tiny, tiny effect called light by light scattering where photons actually interact with each other, but that's an absolutely tiny effect. Um, so for the most part, you just more photons, they just go through a vacuum. Now, if you have uh, the air, for example, or if you have a piece of glass, if you put um, if you put enough photons through it, uh, eventually it will saturate because what's happening is when photons are going through something like glass, they are being absorbed by one atom by by an atom, and then just a tiny time later they're being re-emitted by that atom, and there comes a point at which you've kind of saturated these atoms. They've all been, they've all got, they've all just absorbed photons that they haven't yet emitted the photons. And that, in that situation, the, you'll get kind of saturation of, um, the, the, it will no longer transmit the photons through in the way that you would have expected. And eventually that would happen with intense enough light in the air, although the intensity would have to be incredibly high um, and probably higher even than one would imagine from, from such a setup. I think one is, has a, a much, much better bet than having a lens 
in in orbit because the lens is going to be a big, big thick thing with with lots of glass in the middle is to put a mirror in earth orbit because with a parabolic mirror you can have the same effect of concentrating light except with the lens the rays of light are going through the lens and being concentrated on the other side with a mirror the rays of light are coming into the mirror and they're bouncing back and if the mirror is in a parabolic shape then all the the, the a parabolic shape is such that when rays of light come in uh, parallel from the sun, for example, they're all concentrated into a single focus, a single point in the center of the parabola. Um, and so that would be a more realistic way to do that. Um, oh, actually, that wouldn't, that wouldn't succeed in doing what you wanted at all, because that would concentrate all the light from the sun at this point at the, at the, um, uh, at the center of this paraboloid. What you would have to do, oh yes, no, this, this experiment is pretty doomed, I think, because with a magnifying glass, you're always, the focus, the focal point for the magnifying glass is always right below the magnifying glass. And the thicker the magnifying glass, the closer the focus will be. Um, but uh, uh, so what you are asking for, okay, so, so the case that you might be asking for is essentially a quite thin magnifying glass that's 100 miles away in Earth orbit that is just starting to concentrate light, uh, light rays and when it gets to a particular point on the Earth's surface, all those light rays will be concentrated. The problem is, so in order to concentrate lots of light rays, you've got to have had lots of light rays going through the lens or hitting the mirror. That means you need a very big mirror or a very big lens. That's a problem. I, I, think, I think in the end, this is kind of doomed. And I think uh, the effect of the saturation of, of, of um, uh, this saturation effect from light, I think one's actually, that's probably irrelevant. One's actually far away from such a limit for anything one can imagine there. So I think that's, that's not a likely, likely thing to be able to do. Um, let's see. Um, there's a question about, does a, does a magnifying glass steal energy from the surroundings? Well, like a, when you have a magnifying glass and you're using it to burn something with light from the sun, no, it's just taking light from the sun. Uh, well, what's, what's happening is that light from the sun would have just, those parallel rays of light would have just fallen separately on your piece of paper. But what you're doing with the magnifying glass is you're concentrating all those light rays, which would have fallen on different parts of the piece of paper, you're concentrating them so that they all fall on that single spot in the middle of the piece of paper. And, and that's, it's because you're concentrating all that light, all the energy associated with that light, just in that one place that you would heat that place up. All right, maybe one, one or two more, and then I need to, uh, Go here. Well, let's see. There's one here, quite different. Um, um, let's do that this time. Um, okay. There's a question from Prutz. Are there technologies that were very fragile and unreliable 50 to 100 years ago, but are extremely reliable and widely used today? And then are there early stage technologies that have the potential to be widely used 50 years from now? Well, the most obvious technology that was fragile 50 years ago and is very widely used today is transmitting data through, uh, uh, through various communication lines. Back uh, like 40 years ago, it was hard to transmit data at more than about 30 characters per second. But like, for example, in this live stream I'm doing right now, we're transmitting data at um, uh, you know about hundreds of thousands of times that rate, um, and it's all working just fine. And it's sort of interesting how one got from there's a you know the the most the earliest telephones you know when Alexander Graham Bell was inventing the telephone, one of the things that was an important point was just how cruddy could the sound you got out of a telephone be, and yet have people at the other end still be, understand, be able to understand what was said? And so in the very earliest telephones from 120 or so years ago, the, um, uh, a little bit more than that actually, the, um, uh, the, um, uh, they were probably, by our current standards, they were just um, 
uh, you know, they, they could, you could hear something, but it was really cruddy. Telegraphs had existed for quite a long time, for like 60 years or something, before the telephone. In a telegraph, you're just, uh, you know, you, you just got this key and you're just doing a long press or a short press, dots and dashes, Morse code, all those kinds of things. And it was possible to transmit uh, kind of well enough to be able to tell, oh, there was a, uh, that was a dot, that was a dash. Many years before, it was possible to transmit something which was intelligible speech. And then still before then, then, then to get to the point where you could transmit video, the first kind of demo video phones existed in the 1950s. And it took until, well, basically about 10 years ago before sort of video phone-like technology was robust enough that it could be widely used. So that's a, I think that's a pretty obvious example of um, where there's technology that um, uh, was kind of uh, sort of, there were signs of it, you could say from the 18, early 1800s from telegraphs and things, there were signs that that was possible, but getting to the point where, oh, we're transmitting video routinely all the time, that was a long span of time. The fax machine, which is now kind of almost a thing of the past, where you transmit, uh, you know, today it would be like scan a page, turn it into digital data, uh, send it over a, 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 you know, over, over a network, and then at the other end, make a printout of that page. That was fax machine technology. And the earliest fax machines were made in the mid 1800s. People had uh, ways of uh, people imagined that you would kind of um, um, uh, do something where you're, uh, you're, you're, you're sending something which is ultimately a picture and you're sending it in dots and dashes of a telegraph. But to make that practical took a lot longer. And um, that was, that was a, another example of something where you could sort of see that it was coming, but it took a very long time. I think, you know, space travel is another thing where you know, there are examples of it from long ago, and it's just on the sort of, uh, just sort of advancing to the point where it's becoming uh, more routine now. Um, I think the same um, uh, computers, another good example, where the earliest computers from the 1940s were, well, that kind of by the 1960s, there were practical systems, but they were very, very big. The idea that you would just sort of have a computer in your pocket that was something that took many more years to, to come to fruition. And I think um, um, it's something where uh, if we look at things today, you know, there are some inexorable kinds of, of, uh, of progress. One thing, you know, there was a time when uh, if you were listening to things, you would have, you, you couldn't really get a representation of sound that was as if you were really there. In other words, our ears with their, you know, whatever it is, 50,000 nerve fibers in the auditory nerve and so on, they were what we could hear from a sound when we're right in the room there was much better than what you could get from a record player or a, a tape cassette player or something like this. But there came a time, probably 15, 20 years ago now, when uh, computer sending digital audio by computer got to the point where we can transmit data and sort of recreate the audio at the other end that's as good as what we can transmit through our auditory nerve and it's at the point where the audio is sort of as if you were there we're not quite there with video we will be that's an inexorable thing and you know there are issues the video like our eyes there's a lot that we see kind of out of the out of the side of our visual field um, and most displays, you know, it's a display right in front of you. That's where, you know, virtual reality displays sort of the, one of the bigger effects is that you kind of get to see a, a larger angle. So it's kind of, you're, you're seeing some things in peripheral vision as well as in kind of straight ahead vision. And so that, that's, that's one type of thing, which I think is sort of inexorable. I think that there will probably be slow progress in things, but I don't know how well it will really work in kind of the, um, oh, well, another piece of inexorable progress will be, 
things like augmented reality, being able to have a display that's not only a great big display, but also something which is kind of like I could, I could have a little tiny display thing in my glasses and I could be overlaying um, some, uh, you know, I wouldn't need to have a, a, a sort of a physical computer display out there in the world. I could just have something that's being displayed sort of in, in my glasses or maybe something that's just painting light directly onto the retina at the back of my eye from some little device uh, in my glasses. And that's something which is, you know, there, there have been demos of that kind of technology for a long, long, long time that will eventually become routine. And it will routinely be the case that as you're sort of wandering around, you'll see these little displays of interesting random things based on your geolocation and, and things like that. Uh, there are other kinds of um, uh, things like data transmission, uh, radio-based data transmission. You know, 5G is, is presumably coming. Um, that will be higher rates of data transmission, but there is no obvious, uh, I mean, there's some, some sort of theoretical upper limits to data transmission rates, but they keep on being little tricks to more or less get around those in certain cases. And I think one can expect that and, and the most important way of getting around them, which is what 5G is using, among other things, is instead of having one antenna that's just broadcasting lots of stuff, you know, one cell phone tower that's kind of broadcasting to a big area for every cell phone, you have much more local uh, broadcasts so that you only have to deal with uh, getting, you only need to have your radio be, be in the small area. And that's, um, uh, and, and so then you can kind of deal with having more cell phones there and so on and more data being transmitted at faster rates to more cell phones and all those kinds of things. So I think that will be a thing that, where there's just a lot more kind of um, uh, data that's, um, that's coming through there. I mean, there are, there are just tons of things. I mean, there are tons of things in medicine where you know, we have the beginnings of sort of you know, the 3D printable organ type thing. We have the beginnings of being able to have kind of molecular scale computers basically that operate like the kinds of things that happen uh, biologically in our cells, but being able to program those things so that instead of just having, you know, a drug molecule that goes to a particular place and, uh, uh, and has a sort of chemical um, uh, and chemically does what it does, you can have something where there's essentially something the size of a molecule that is able to uh, kind of go to some place in the body and be doing sort of, uh, and be actually kind of computing what to do. That's, that's uh, kind of a, um, another thing that I think we can sort of see the early, early signs of that. The early, early signs of sort of synthetic biology where we're able to kind of create a molecular scale biology-like thing that works in a particular way. I mean, I could, I could go on at a, at a great length because there are just a lot of things where one can kind of see the beginnings of signs of things and, um, uh, and, and you know, it's going to be a while before they can come to fruition. Um, I think uh, there's a question asked here, um, is there anything where the opposite has happened? Um, something which is fragile today, but was stable a century ago. Does technology universally get better? You know, that's an interesting question. I mean, people say that, oh, you know, this amazing sword that was made in this very special way at some time in the past, you know, nothing like that exists today. I think, you know, when there are swords that were made from metal that came from meteorites and things, that's a very rare sword that had to be very carefully made, uh, very carefully, you know, find the materials for it or whatever. I think it can be the case that there are kind of lost arts where people would do things sort of, the handcrafted version, which existed 100 years ago, nobody knows how to do that anymore. And what you get that is sort of the machine built version does not have quite the level of, uh, of, of some kind of adaptation to the materials and so on that existed in the past. Um, I would say in terms of technology that's been lost, I mean, that, you know, it, that's a complicated issue because there's technologies where people hope they're lost because that they they don't seem to have they don't seem to do good stuff and they seem to have a lot of bad consequences too um and i think that there are you know there are well we'll we'll see how many of those there are i mean there there are certainly things where you know some 
nasty virus or something which was more or less exterminated. Um, it's like, well, you know, was it really exterminated? Can you keep a little supply of it? Things like this. Those are things that um, kind of are, are, well, no, we don't have any more of that now because we really don't want to have it more of it. Um, I think that um, uh, trying to think of examples where there were sort of lost arts of lost technology that doesn't exist today that existed in the past. What kinds of things can I think of? Um, yeah, I mean, there are, there are constantly pieces of technology that come and don't quite make it. An example, back 40 years ago, I was very briefly an enthusiast of one-handed keyboards, okay, where uh, often so-called chord keyboards, where you would press two buttons at the same time. To, to, and and you, could, you could type in principle very fast because you don't have to move your fingers. You're just like, well, I push these two fingers or those two fingers and you're not moving them around. And I thought I had this whole idea that, oh, it would be kind of cool. You know, I'm always interested in sort of personal efficiency kinds of things. You can kind of uh, walk around and you can have some nice, you know, I was thinking about, I'd seen virtual reality displays and things. You kind of walk around with some display and you can just be typing, uh, not looking at your fingers, and typing on this chord keyboard. I don't think people you know, do that. People type on their, with their thumbs on, uh, on cell phones and things, but I just don't think that technology, which briefly seemed to take off and then just disappeared again, don't really completely know why. So that's sort of an example of a, of a piece of technology going backwards. I would say that um, there, are, there are probably pieces of technology, let me think about this. Um, you know, there, there are plenty of things where people say, uh, that piece of technology that, um, uh, that, that sort of um, is some combustion device that kind of belches out smoke or something. Oh, let's not use that anymore. Let's make a version that um, is much cleaner. And so then that kind of technology uh, kind of disappears. Um, and, um, uh, but, but isn't, it's not, it's, it's in practice lost. I mean, there's, there's plenty of technology where people built it once and people have kind of almost forgotten how to do it. I mean, whether it's early spacecraft, where the plans have been lost, whether it's nuclear reactors, where people built them and that's kind of like nobody really remembers exactly how certain things work. Um, there are things like that, more local kinds of things. In terms of general classes of technology that have been lost, um, trying to think. I mean, there was certainly over historical time that we know of like the Antikythera device from 2000 years ago that was kind of a clockwork computer that wasn't sort of recreated until the 1600s. That was an example of lost technology. Um, but I think uh, um, I'm trying to think over a 50 year span of things I might remember that were technologies. I mean, there were there have been plenty of medical things that have come and gone during that period of time. And people said, this is a great idea. We can cure this with this. And then people said, well, no, you can't really. It has all kinds of you know, bad effects and it's um, not. Uh, uh, and so that sort of gets gets walked back. But um, I'm trying to think. And, um, um, you know, there are things where there was a technology like, for example, when I was a kid, one off, you know, I typically would write with an ink pen that had liquid ink that you would just fill the pen with, you know, and it had some elaborate plunger system and nibs and all this kind of thing. People do that as a, as a matter of being sort of quaint and, um, uh, and kind of uh, uh, with the gravitas of history type thing. But that whole technology of sort of ink, ink wells and filling things with ink and so on, that technology is not really very much with us anymore because sort of other technology has moved on, so it's less important. Um, so, I mean, I, there, are, there are all these kinds of things. Uh, another piece of technology I might mention, um, before there were electronic calculators, there had been a long process of uh, perfecting kind of mechanical pocket calculators. And um, there's, uh, oh gosh, what is the thing called? Um, it's a little device. Uh, one of my kids has one of these things that um, it was exotically, it was made in Liechtenstein, um, which was perhaps the center of the mechanical calculator industry for perhaps a little while, I don't know. But um, they're, these, uh, they're these things that are just very densely filled with, the whole thing is filled with cogs and you turn things and you move things and you can sort of 
calculate, uh, you can sort of pocket calculate mechanically that way. Um, that's been sort of a lost art doing that. And, and, you know, what's funny about these lost arts is then it turns out one day somebody needs it. Like I, uh, one question is if you want to send a spacecraft to the surface of Venus, it's very hot there. And uh, most ordinary materials just melt. Metals don't necessarily melt, but computers that are based on semiconductors, semiconductors are very sensitive to heat. And um, so by the time you're at 350 degrees centigrade or whatever the temperature is, there's no way that an ordinary semiconductor will work there. So you kind of have to have a plan B for how do you have a computer on the surface of Venus? And one of the more exotic possibilities is, well, make it be a mechanical computer. And obviously the technology of mechanical computers is that's a lost art, but perhaps there's a use case for it that may emerge even in the future. And um, oh, there's a question here about what were the next advance in microprocessors, 3D lithography. You know, this is one of these funny things where there are these, it will be there in the future kinds of claims that exist over very long periods of time. I mean, I remember in the late 1970s, people saying when you, you know, make microprocessors, you're, you're sort of designing the circuit and the circuit is just a two-dimensional circuit. You've got little wires and transistors and so on. And they're all just arranged in, uh, on this chip that is a, um, uh, just a two-dimensional thing. I remember people saying in the late 1970s, there will be 3D chips instead of just having the circuit arranged on that single surface the circuit will be arranged in, in arbitrary depth with wires going up and down as well as uh, sort of left and right and so on. Um, and I don't think that technology, it still hasn't arrived. I mean, I think there are probably issues with that technology to do with heat generation and so on that might be different even from the problem of, of like fabricating the original circuit. But it's sort of funny to me that that's something where people said it's almost here now from, um, uh, from that long ago. It is strange that there are technologies where you hear that for a really long period of time, like flat screen televisions, another one where one knew they were coming for a long time before they actually came. Then there are technologies where, honestly, they kind of snuck up on one. Like, for example, drones is an example. You know, the idea that you could have kind of a quadcopter type thing, you know, a helicopter like thing with four rotors. That idea certainly existed long ago, and there were test versions of that sort of where people tried to control them back from the 1950s and maybe even earlier. Um, but that technology, people always said, oh, well, you can have a remote control helicopter. But those are kind of difficult to operate and so on. And then sometime, when was it? It was probably like a little less than 10 years ago now. Suddenly, uh, the, suddenly sort of there burst onto the scene drones with four rotors. And what made that possible was having flight controllers, things which can control the speed of the rotors based on the orientation of the drone, can do that with sort of easily enough that you can actually build them into the drone so that it can control itself. So that even though there's an instability where one side of the drone will start going down, then you make that rotor go faster, you write it. And um, that's, uh, that's, that's what makes drones possible is the flight controller system that exists, the control system for keeping the drone stable. But that, to me, it was like, I didn't really expect that. It wasn't, it wasn't something, I mean, even though that technology sort of precursors existed for ages, I wasn't really tracking when will we get to the point where that's possible. I mean, I suppose right now, an example of that will be is electric airplanes. Um, you know, there will come a time, presumably, when battery technology, presumably, when battery technology is good enough, you might as well just... Uh, you know, rather than, than burning fuel or something like this, you might as well just have a battery on your plane, you know, uh, sort of charge it up and off your plane goes. Obviously, that's been possible for, um, for tiny model planes for ages, but to make a, a big plane, to have it work so that you can really do that in a big plane, there are test versions of that right now, but to do that on a serious scale is something that presumably will come. Um, and... Uh, it's something where it's sort of inexorable that that will come. I mean, just like, uh, you know, people have been talking about flying cars since, well, I remember seeing a popular ma a mechanics magazine that's sort of a, a place where, in fact, I think I have one of these, uh, you know, the car of the future from the 1930s, I think. And it's a flying car. And it's like, 
well, we're nearly 100 years later, there aren't any flying cars. And, uh, you know, I think it's an inexorable thing. There will eventually be flying cars. Um, it's uh, the question of how much people will care about flying cars is an interesting one. It's just like people say, uh, you know, at this point in this pandemic and so on, people have learned that it's possible to do a lot more things remotely than one expected. I have been a remote CEO for 30 years. So it was, uh, um, you know, I kind of already knew this. But uh, this question about, um, uh, you know, uh, how important is it that you are in a particular place versus being just connected? How important is it that you can take your flying car and go to such and such a place, um, you know, quickly? Is that something you care really a lot about or not so much about? Another one of these sort of inexorable things is supersonic planes, which again, uh, you know, I think there's an initiative now to try and do that again. Um, I think, you know, that's one of these things that will eventually happen. And the reasons why it didn't happen with Concorde and so on are, fairly detailed reasons having to do with efficiency and cost and sonic booms and making uh, and sort of the particular aerodynamics of uh, that produced shock waves that were really loud on the ground and so on. I remember when I was a kid, uh, quite often seeing Concorde fly over and, um, you know, you would uh, didn't um, and occasionally in some sort of test situation, it would it would uh, make a sonic boom. Um, over over sort of a populated area and so on, and it was was pretty loud. Um, but you know that's that's an example of something where with more detailed, careful technology and careful understanding of shock fronts and so on, one can expect that that will be solved and, and such things will exist. And you know I think it's kind of the inevitable flying car, so to speak, is the only thing that's hard with that kind of technology is figuring out you know what's the time scale and. When will things become reliable enough? When will it become easy enough to, I mean, it's actually a lot easier to navigate in the air than it is on the ground. There's much less to run into in the air. And it's much more of just, well, go in this line and you know, get to where you're going. Um, obviously, if there start being a zillion flying cars, there are all kinds of, oh, we've got to have all these algorithms for avoiding other flying cars. And, you know, are we certain that will work? And what about if there's a, a giant um, bird that's going to come and attack your flying car and all kinds of different, different issues like that? Um, but uh, in any case, um, let's see. Well, I think we should probably, um, uh, and I'm actually, I'm still, I'm still um, looping a little bit on this question about does technology universally get better? And I'm, I'm kind of wondering about some of these things where, yeah, you know, there are places where some natural material was kind of a really good way to do something, but that natural material was in short supply or people decided it was a bad thing to be using that natural resource. And so let's have kind of an artificial version instead. And it wasn't, it wasn't quite as good for one reason or another. Um, and I think those are, there are places where sort of technology has gone backwards for those reasons. I'm trying to think in terms of... Uh, uh, of electronics, for example, mostly that's very much gone forwards. There are some slight uh, things, um, but um, uh, mostly that's that's a just went forwards. I think that um, um, thinking about other areas, you know, as I say, in medicine, things tend to go forwards, backwards, forwards, backwards. People realize, oh, that wasn't such a good idea. Oh, the trade-offs are different, and so on. In um, uh, um, yeah, I mean, there are technologies where they appear and then they like ho hovercraft. They were another technology. I remember from when I was a kid, that was kind of supposed to be the future of transportation. You know, uh, boats and things are a thing of the past. It's all hovercraft all the way down. Um, that didn't pan out at the time. Don't know exactly why. Um, and who knows, maybe that's a thing where people will say in the future, oh, that was a lost technology. What a big mistake. I'm not sure. Um, anyway, uh, well, I think we should wrap up uh, here for today. And uh, thanks for joining us. And um, see you again another time.